All right, engineers. nerds, in this video, we're gonna talk about the regulation and the control of respiration. So what's really important about this whole respiration process is we talked about it a little bit. We talked about some of these actual nuclei within the brainstem and how they're controlling the respiration signals to the external intercostals in the diaphragm. But I wanna go into a little bit more detail on them. I'm gonna mention these guys, talk about what they're responding to, what they're actually doing, and then maybe just a little bit about some of the nuclei that they're consisting of. Okay, and then we'll talk about specifically how uh, chemoreceptors, peripheral, central, how stretch receptors and proprioceptors and irritant receptors and juxtacapillary receptors, and how all those things can influence these centers to can change the respiratory rate and re respiratory depth. All right, so let's go ahead and start here. So inside of the actual, so this is basically our central nervous system. If I come from the side, I'm taking a, a sagittal cut and we're looking at it from the lateral view. Okay, so just so you know, this right here, this structure up here is actually consisting of the cerebrum. This right here is the cerebellum. This is the midbrain, I'm just gonna put MB. This is actually the pons. This is the medulla. And then down here is the spinal cord, right? And we'll talk about specific sections of the spinal cord. Okay, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk specifically first about the pons. In the upper aspect of the pons, in the upper part of the pons, there's a special center here. And it's consisting of what's called a parabrachial nucleus. And this actual structure here is called the pneumotaxic center. So the pneumotaxic center is specifically going to be controlling the actual fine tuning of the respiratory rate and the respiratory depth. What do I mean by that? So the pneumotaxic center can send down signals into this nucleus and this nucleus and basically inhibit inspiration and allow for the transition of inspiration into expiration. So if I'm inspiring, you know how I transition from the inspiration to the expiration? That's the job of the pons. So the pons controls what's going on with the lung expansion. And whenever the lungs expand to a certain part, they receive that signal, send that signal down here into these specific centers and inhibit the inspiratory process and allow for the expiratory process to begin, okay? So they're basically fine tuning the transition between inspiration and expiration. That's their job. And again, they're also receiving signals from specific types of peripheral receptors and we'll talk about those. The one right under it, this is a cool center. This is actually called the apneuistic center. Okay, so the apneuistic center is really cool. And the reason why it's a really cool center, what is apneuesis? How would you define apneuistic or apneuistic breathing? So apneuistic breathing is a prolonged inspiration. So if I do that, that's apneuesis, right? But apneuistic center, so basically what is it doing? It can send signals specifically down into the VRG and the DRG, so these two nuclei here, and trigger them to undergo the inspiratory signals to cause inspiration. And how they know that is whenever there was damage to this actual pneumotaxic center, so pneumotaxic center, you know how it's actually controlling and ins in inhibiting inspiration? If this is damaged, would it be able to inhibit the transition from inspiration to expiration? No. And this would cause this prolonged inspiration, which is called apneustic breathing, because then the actual VRG and the DRG would only be receiving signals from the apneustic center. So again, I want you to understand, the apneuistic center can influence the, this structure here. It can also influence this structure here. And the pneumotaxic center, same thing. It can influence this structure here. And the pneumotaxic center can also influence this structure here. Okay? So now, let's go down to these two guys. Okay, so we got pneumotaxic center, which is consisting of what's called the parabrachial nucleus. And it's also consisting of what's called the colicofuse complex, but we're not gonna talk about that. Just know that this is the pneumotaxic center and what it does, apneustic center and what it does, okay? Inhibits inspiration, transitions to expiration. Receives peripheral stimulus. This one's also receiving peripheral stimulus specifically from the stretch receptors, and it's triggering inspiration. Whenever this center is damaged, this center is the only one operating and causes prolonged inspiration, which is called apneustic breathing. Then we come down here. You see these group of black neurons? They're actually located within the dorsal and lateral aspect of the medulla. These ones right here, I'm gonna denote CCC. So central chemoreceptors. So these are your central chemoreceptors. I'm gonna put CCC, central chemoreceptors. All right, so again, central chemoreceptors. Let's just put CCR, what the heck is wrong with me? CCR, central chemoreceptors. So central chemoreceptors, sorry. 
These central chemoreceptors are very interesting, and they're actually going to be able to sense any changes in the pH of the cerebral spinal fluid and some of the interstitial fluid inside the central nervous system. So you know whenever CO2 levels rise, it increases carbonic acid, which increases protons and bicarb? Well, that could stimulate the central chemoreceptors. What about whenever the CO2 levels drop? So if your CO2 levels drop, called hypocapnia, it'll decrease the amount of carbonic acid, decrease the amount of protons being formed, and inhibit these centers. Why is that important? Because this can influence this center here. Unbelievable, right? Okay, so these are your central chemoreceptors. Now, this one here, this maroon colored one, is actually called the dorsal respiratory group. So this is the dorsal respiratory group. Now the dorsal respiratory group, if you know your neuroanatomy, it's very close and intimate with what's called the nucleus of tractus solitarius, okay? So the nucleus of tractus solitarius is actually going to be one of the main nuclei of the DRG. And the nucleus of tractus solitarius actually has two functions, right? Or this DRG, we can say, has two functions, which consists of the nucleus of tractus solitarius. The DRG has the ability to receive stretch receptor signals. So it has the ability to receive information from stretch receptors, from proprioceptors, from juxtacapillary receptors, from chemoreceptors, both central and peripheral. So it's amazing. As well as it can send signals down to go and trigger inspiration via to go into the external intercostals and the diaphragm. So it's amazing, all right? So again, DRG consisting of the nucleus of tractus solitarius, and it can actually receive peripheral stimulation, and it can trigger inspiration, all right? We'll go into these in a lot more detail whenever we go through this whole process. And this last one over here is actually gonna be the meat and potatoes of it all. This is actually called the VRG, which stands for ventral respiratory group. And you know why they call this the ventral respiratory group? Because again, this is the ventral side or anterior side of the central nervous system, and this is the posterior or dorsal side of the central nervous system, okay? Now the VRG actually consists of four main nuclei. It consists of expiratory and inspiratory neurons. One of them is called the Boatzinger complex, and that controls expiration. Another one is called the pre-Boatzinger complex. You know why the pre, I wanna write that one down. That actually is a really important one. The pre-Boatzinger complex. What the pre boatzinger complex is, is it's the pacemaker neurons. The pacemaker neurons are, you know, what is pacemaker neurons? They can actually have, they have specialized cation channels that are constantly leaky and allowing for cations to flow into this neuron. And whenever this neuron is actually having these cations, that actually can be spontaneously depolarized and send action potentials. And those action potentials can go out to our diaphragm and our external intercostals, right? And if that's the case, it can trigger inspiration spontaneously, intrinsically on its own. So these are very special because these are actually the pacemaker neurons. So they're what helps to be able to set the pace. What is the normal respiration rate and depth for an individual? How would you normally describe that? So the pacemaker is normally going to be setting this actual pace at about, um, you know, what is this term, eupnea? Eupnea is basically normal, quiet breathing at about 12 to 16 breaths per minute, okay? So 12 to 16 breaths per minute, and that is the job of this pre boatzinger complex. I did want to mention that one. Boatzinger complex, it's still significant, but again, these things change all the time. So Boatzinger complex controls expiration. pre boatzinger is the pacemaker. There is another one which is called the nucleus retroambiguous. And the nucleus retroambiguous is actually going to be consisting of both inspiratory neurons and expiratory neurons. So it can control the actual inspiratory signals going to the diaphragm and the external intercostals, as well as it can supply certain expiratory signals. And the last one is the nucleus ambiguous, and it's a little bit posterior to all those nuclei that I mentioned. And the nucleus ambiguous is responsible for inspiration by controlling your soft palate, you know, the uvula and the soft palate, as well as controlling some of the pharynx muscles and the larynx muscles. Okay, so to control the inspiratory process there. Okay, so let's review this again. And then we're gonna go into all these centers, I mean, all these actual mechanisms. So again, pneumotaxic center, it's actually fine tuning the respiratory rate and respiratory uh, depth by basically doing what? Transition of inspiration to expiration. Apneustic center, what is it doing? Controlling inspiration. Whenever the pneumotaxic center is damaged, this one will send primary signals and cause apnoesis, prolonged breathing, right, or inspirations. Pneumotaxic center is consisting of the parabrachial nucleus. Central chemoreceptors are responding to pH with response to changes in the partial pressure of CO2. 
and the DRG is consisting of the nucleus attractus solitarius, and it receives peripheral sti uh, stimulus from chemoreceptors, stretch receptors, proprioceptors. And the VRG is consisting of the Boatzinger complex, which sends in expiratory signals, pre-Boatzinger complex, which has pacemaker neurons that set a normal pace of about 12 to 16 breaths per minute. It consists of the nucleus retroambiguous, which controls the diaphragm and the external intercostals via inspiration. And it also has expiratory signals. And the last one, which was posterior to those guys that I mentioned, is the nucleus ambiguous, and that controls the laryngeal muscles, pharyngeal muscles, and the soft palate muscles for inspiration. Okay, holy crap, we got through all of those. So now, let's see how certain changes can actually influence these centers and how they send their signals. Before we do that, you know the VRG and the DRG, I told you, they actually both have these signals that they can do. They can actually have, they both have inspiratory neurons. And these inspiratory neurons can actually move downwards, right? So this can actually give off fibers, and these can actually come all the way down here into the ventral gray horn. So here, these are actually sending signals down both from the VRG and from the DRG, the inspiratory centers of the medulla. And then what are they doing? They're letting off their actual axons onto these specialized, right here, cell bodies of the somatic motor neurons, which are located within the anterior or ventral gray horn of the spinal cord. And when these actual neurons are stimulated, look what happens. They actually come out as this nerve here. Let's say that it comes out actually at the C3 and C5 root. That's the diaphragm, that's gonna be going to the diaphragm. That's called the phrenic nerve. If it's coming at the T1 to T1 T1 to T11 area, that's gonna be the intercostal nerves. So let's actually see this here. So it's actually gonna be bringing these fibers here. And then look, boom, in external intercostals. And again, this is gonna give off this branch here, which is gonna be going to the diaphragm. And again, if this is actually going, this is going to be specifically the intercostal nerves, which is coming from the T1 to T11. And this is actually gonna be the phrenic nerve. All right, and this is gonna be from the cervical plexus. All right, now, these nerves are sending these actual signals. From where? From the VRG to the DRG, right? So if these guys are sending inspiratory signals down, it's gonna stimulate these somatic motor neurons. If these somatic motor neurons are stimulated, what's gonna to happen to the action potentials traveling down these axons? It's gonna increase. If these action potentials increase, what's it gonna to do to the actual frequency upon which this guy is stimulated? It's gonna increase the stimulation, right? And if this external intercostals are contracting, what are they doing? If you guys remember, the bucket handle movement, right? They're pulling the ribs outward and upward and pulling the sternum out. Increase in thoracic cavity volume for inspiration. The diaphragm was doing what? When he was being stimulated via the phrenic nerve, he was actually depressing downwards, increasing thoracic cavity volume and changing the pressures to pull air down for inspiration. We already know that. Now, besides this, when these guys are doing this and triggering these actual muscles to contract and trigger this inspiration process, that's great. But now we have to see what things can affect this. Now let's start there. 